Francis Bacon, an artist that could be described as the most violent artist in history, but is accredited as the inspiration for Silent Hill, Hellraiser, and Jacob's Ladder. He was an artist that was hard to forget, and today on Sva Media, I'll tell you about the man behind the violence. Francis was born in October 1909, and like many children who grew up to be internationally recognised, Francis's childhood was riddled with scars. Although he was different from most. You see, as an Irish child raised by an Englishman, a man who was devoutly Protestant in a Catholic society back when that mattered, this made Francis somewhat isolated, despite the fact that he himself was an atheist. That left him distanced from normality, and his youngest youth was spent during the First World War. Some believe that this changed his rejection of normality to a sturgent hatred for it. He had been stated as saying, My childhood was something cold and something hard, like a block of ice, and with his severe asthma and shyness, he never really found people to take that feeling of loneliness away from him, and his father's outdoor profession only escalated his poor health making his problems vastly worse. But in a lot of ways, you can see that these few years had a profound influence in his works. Many paintings having men in pain, seeming to grasp for air with a focus in the oral region, and a box of glass separated from fresh air, much like he might have felt with his asthma outdoors. His frailty only strained his relationship with his father, and when Francis started to show homosexual tendencies, his father became more aggressive and intolerant, and would even have his staff whip him and assault him on a regular basis. But despite this, Francis was conflicted. He had a deep hatred for his father, but at the same time he was sexually attracted to him. He would only confess this to his closest friends later in life, but these feelings would stagnate and evolve into masochism. This led to a lust for depravity and an obsession with pain and darkness. These fights with his father would only escalate in his teenage years, as he would have sex with his father's horses, and with his sexual acts evolving from a sin in their eyes to a truly monstrous act, they completely abandoned him sending him to live with an older man. Whether they knew that the man was bisexual or not is up for debate, but it's undeniable that this man had fallen in love with Francis Bacon by the age of 17, and he took him to live in Berlin, Germany. Francis would take part in Berlin's homosexual communities, and this made him feel at home. The lack of authority and freedom of expression was palpable. He felt like he could channel his strange emotions into creativity, and this was after the First World War, and by this point Berlin had developed an association with debauchery. So Bacon's first taste of sexual freedom was not ordinary, it was corrupted. This made his strange behaviours much worse as in these gay bars in Berlin, the social norm was sadism. Francis later visited Paris in 1928, where he found another love in art. This is the point in life where he was given a purpose. He would visit Paris often, but when he saw an exhibition on Picasso, he was fixated. He knew that he wanted to be a painter. He'd made connections with some designers in Paris, and they were supportive. So when he moved to England, he would develop a name for himself, not as an artist, but as an interior decorator. He would do this in private as he worked on his art ability, but he became almost embarrassed about the idea of being a decorator, and he became more and more obsessed with the idea of his painting. He would be a shy artist, practicing and destroying his own work. One of the pieces that survived his early work was The Crucifixion, 1933, and this was the painting that got him noticed from the artist community. But this was during a time where Francis hadn't developed a personality or an artistic method. So some viewers and spectators would actually compare it to Rembrandt's Slaughtered Ox, but it was undeniable that this was created with Picasso's unique surrealist style in mind. This piece may have been an exercise in his view of religion. It seems shrouded, distant, and even unclear. Some of his other earlier work would be The Dance in 1933 and Portrait in 1931. But whilst there was interest for his works, at this point it was clear that he was untrained and unrefined. And after the fact, we can see that his self-criticism was at its strongest at this point, because between 1936 and 1945 there wasn't actually any paintings that had survived his madness. The war would have played a big part in his absence, but he did paint, and by 1945 he would release three of his most famous works. Three studies. These were truly unusual pieces, especially for their time. They were angry, sad, and an expression of life after war. I feel that the first is a great sadness. It hangs its head low from its long neck and hides its face in shame from the viewer. The second seems to be of anger, but also a fragile state. Its weak legs holding its lumpy body, blended from its eyes being covered in cloth, and seemingly unprepared for the frame. The last is of pain, screaming and standing in a sharp and entrancing surface. Perhaps the purpose was to reflect his own masochistic tendencies. 
And some might actually say that these paintings directly influence the design for the Numbodies in Silent Hill. Some would describe these paintings as the day that art became ferile. Others would ask why these paintings had to exist if Picasso had done it first. But it's clear that people didn't care for the violence of his works after one of the most violent times in human history. But it was also a time of existentialism, when people felt like life had to be experienced. Because another war might come, and these could be their last moments. And that fed his ambition not only for art, but for life. To be free of rules. And shortly after this period, he would meet Erika Brosner. She was a contemporary art dealer and fell in love with his work. No longer would he need to rely on gambling parties to pay his bills. He was a financially viable artist. She even sold one of his paintings to the MoMA, and that painting was named uncreatively Painting 1946. He would say that it evolved from one thing to the next, but it can be interpreted in many different ways. From the traditional Englishman returning from war, leaving the butchery behind him but forever being marked by his crimes. It could also be interpreted as the quintessential Englishman's self-image and identity being in stark contrast with the world that surrounds him. This is where I feel where his work had tapped into a level of fear that had never been seen before and its imagery that would dominate horror visuals for the years to come. Erica would try and nurture Francis and help him, but his life of torment and debauchery didn't just go away. He would drink and gamble and be sexually promiscuous often leading to an interference with his work. He would go to Monte Carlo and gamble and neglect his very short deadlines. And between that and his habit of destroying his own works, he would often have to work quickly and make just enough paintings for an exhibit on the 12th hour. This would lead him to producing very little art in the last half of the 40s. He would also use this time to reevaluate his work. He no longer wanted to be known as a derivative of Picasso. He tried to evaluate what he had to do. He felt like his work should reflect his own life, that of a person in turmoil. Some of the work was astonishing from this period though. He created the Head series, which were some of his darkest pieces. I feel like he'd found a fascinating place in the uncanny valley, where you may be aware of the figure, you may even may recognise it as a head of a man or a beast, but there was more. There was a darkness and a torture to them. It left you uncomfortable and unsure. It was almost the smell before sight, the chill in your neck before something terrible happened. And this would be the quintessential tone of horror, even to this day, be it film, game, novel or even art. His name and convention for his work never improved, but in the early 50s, his work really did. In 1952, we got studies of a crouching nude and its untitled siblings. In 1953, we got studies of a portrait of a Pope innocent and two figures, aka the buggers. But this was when Bacon was faced with his biggest barrier as an artist. You see, he wasn't particularly the greatest drawer. He was a great painter, to be sure, but his line work was weak. He turned to things like boxing magazines and things like Maybridge's photography to bridge this gap in skill. We've talked a lot about Bacon's sexuality, but also found love. The first was Peter Lacey, who he met in the early 50s. He was a Spitfire pilot in the Second World War, a charming, straight-faced, sober man, but under the mask, he was a very twisted man. From his PTSD to the traumatic events of the war, he was a very unpredictable man, and he was certainly a sadist. And most importantly, he was a poor influence on Francis's life. And without his support group, Francis could only be drawn in by this man, and he was a genuine risk to Francis's life. Peter would often beat Francis, but Francis was a masochist, so he seemed to get some sort of enjoyment out of it. He even got thrown through a glass window in the second story of a building, and he contracted some terrible damage to his face, and for some crazy reason he stayed with his abuser. He used him as a figure in his work, almost haunting the paintings of the time. As a man, Francis had a hard time under Peter's thumb, but as an artist, some say he blossomed but thankfully, they did break up. After he was released from his sadist lover, he found a greater level of commercial success. That was at the Moorborough Fine Art Gallery, where they understood his skill and they would buy his work, and within three years they'd even gotten him exhibitions at well-established places like the Tate. And by 1962, that relationship would lead to another great trilogy of works, three studies of a crucifixion. These paintings were a lot more abstract than his earlier work, with less defined figures and an emphasis on the gory and undefined corpse. The first of two figures, a man and a woman in the centre, in disapproval and disgust over the corpse that lay in the foreground, almost rushing to leave that corpse where it lay. The next was of a corpse laying in bed, mangled and folded, but also vulnerable in an open room. The next is of a corpse pinned in a glass container on a wall, 
a shadowy figure covering their mouth in disgust. Some would say that this was a piece in self-reflection, that the public had still rejected his work and the critics would still dismiss him, but he still puts himself out there. Others would say this is how he views his art, that he was very aware that they were gruesome and violent, and this is how he viewed the public's perception. At this point, Francis was a phenomenal success. He was met with celebration as his critics calmed their voices, but in a cruel twist of fate, his first lover Peter Lacey died in Tangier. After this event, he was deeply saddened. He didn't work much at all, but after a few years, something had changed. He started painting women, like the three studies of Muriel Belcher, the collection of Henrietta, and the portrait of Isabel Rossmith. And this change in figure would dominate his work from 1966 to 1967. At the same time as this period, Francis's masochism had escalated. He would go to clubs and parties and disappear. Only he reappeared days later, cut and bruised. His friends at the time had even given up on asking him what happened, because they knew that's how he lived. At one point, a friend even had to call a doctor to the studio in Reese's Muse, where he sustained a great deal of facial injuries. He didn't ask for plastic surgeries, but what he did ask his doctor to do was to stitch him up without any kind of painkiller. This is when even his medical professionals understood his joy for pain. A big part of his access to these kinds of environments may be attributed to one of his subjects, George Dyer, who introduced him to the rougher side of London and people like the Cray brothers, but George would become Francis's second love. Which was strange. For all that George was a man on the wrong side of town, he was a soft man. Francis would want him to be rough and aggressive like Peter, but George had a soft heart. The unfortunate truth is that Francis would try to make George into the man that he wanted, and no matter how well he did on canvas, George in real life never became a sadist like Peter was, and George never found joy in being painted. He felt like the art was horrible, and questioned if this is the way that Francis viewed him. George and his inadequacies and rage would destroy property, and even art, but never Francis. And Francis lost his self-image, painting less and less. But as he distanced himself from George, he started to visit Paris more. And through a growing connection with the artists and writers of Paris, he landed an exhibition at the Grand Palais, which meant he was the first English artist to have a show in that gallery. This was a massive moment for Francis. But it's almost as if when he became more successful, George's misery escalated. And after the show, George was found with a male prostitute in his room, drunk. Francis left, and by the time he'd returned, George had died of via overdose. This plagued Francis, not knowing if it was suicide or overdose. His biggest moment in life as an artist, a day after his death, he had to do something. He proceeded with the show, hiding the body for two days, but after the event, he would return to the room where his lover had died, and he would paint. The only paintings he created in 1973 were created over four days, and they were all of him or George in that room. His work would come to a screeching halt. He had to process these emotions. But in the 1970s and 80s, he was a massive celebrity, being accredited in thanks for many films like The Last Tango in France, and being collected by some very important people. The problem was that he was old. A man so driven by sex and passion and pain, yet in his mind, too old to express it. And this is where John Edwards would come into the picture. Not as a lover, but as a maternal figure. An art with John as the figure would stand out. They were softer and more gentle, and it may just be me, but he appears to be out of the literal box in many of Bacon's pieces. This to me shows John was out of the masochistic relationship status that Francis had put all others in. Near the end of his life, he would do more paintings of John, and he would do a few landscapes that were outstanders and side pieces of Francis's career, but in my opinion, they weren't as impactful. They were just as important in the grand scheme of things and in the psychology of Francis, but they lacked that quintessential tone that gave Bacon his power. His friends would die and he would live. Soho wasn't the same for him and he began to fade, but he would rework three studies from 1945. You could see the evolution of a master at work. Some became more feminine, some more complete, but they all felt so much more isolated. In April 1992, Francis Bacon died of a heart attack, and the world lost a true artist. So you guys, I thought I'd try something different, rather than doing an author, doing something a little more abstract, like an artist. Let me know what you guys thought. If you liked this, don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. And if you have any other interesting people of history that you want me to look at, feel free to ask, as your opinion is the most important. I'll see you guys next time.